I don't really do feel like it's a letdown. Psalm 28. That beats any of this contemporary stuff nowadays. Man, that, that speaks to the soul and it honors God. Okay, we're going to talk about that, God. Psalm 28. And let's go ahead and pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for all the work that's put in the, the music. Thank you for uh, my wife that heads that up, Lord. What a blessing that is. And Lord, I just pray that you'd help us to appreciate you and adore you. And we are looking forward to the day when you are reigning on earth. That would be a good time. And sooner the better. We ask you to help us to understand, though, until then, uh, why you're silent about a lot of things. And I pray you'd help us to trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Psalms 28. Uh, doctrinally, this, this psalmist here, historically it's David. And it's like David on the run, where he's asking God to do some things, and God's not doing anything for him, it seems like. But doctrinally, this is an individual in the tribulation time period who's running for his life and he's crying out to God, and God is silent. So in verse 1, Unto thee will I cry, O Lord, my rock, be not silent to me, lest, thou, lest if thou be silent to me, I become like them that go down into the pit. He says, Hear the voice of my supplications. When I cry unto thee, when I lift up my hands toward thy holy oracle, draw me not away with the wicked and with the workers of iniquity, which speak peace uh, to their neighbors, but mischief is in their heart. Okay, so when you see workers of iniquity, that's, that's a very strong clue that that's jumping into the tribulation time period uh, as far as doctrine. Okay, if you would... Keep your finger in Psalm 28, we'll come back to it, and if uh, look in Psalm 83, is another idea about uh, God being silent. So in Psalm 83, it, it is doctrinally, as many of these psalms doctrinally are uh, dealing with tribulation and second coming, and... Um, if you understand the doctrines of that, it allows the Bible to become uh, more open, more real to you. Psalm 83, he says of the same idea, he says, Keep not thou silence, O God, hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people. In the context, that would be Israel. And consulted against thy hidden ones, and then so forth down the line. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to take time to actually prove why that is a tribulation passage, but the idea is the silence of God. Both of these psalms, the writer is begging God not to be silent uh, towards his request. He's, he's in a panic, he's in a bad situation, he's running for his life. He's, he's trying to get a hold of God. He's trying to ask for direction. He's trying to get God to deliver him. And God is uh, remaining silent. Now, there's a doctrinal reason for that in the trib. But the silence of God has, long, has been a long-standing argument or conundrum for man. Okay, why do righteous people suffer? Okay, the book of Job kind of goes through that idea. Why do righteous people suffer? Okay, now, most atheists and agnostics, they will use this idea of God's silence to justify their atheism or their agnosticism, uh, where they say God must be either indifferent, that would be an agnostic or a deist, where they claim that God created it and then just kind of threw his hands up in disgust and said, okay, you take care of it. Okay, that'd be a deist, more or less. Uh, an atheist, it depends on their motive of atheism, okay, where a young person that's pretty, had a pretty cushy life and he's in state college and he believes in atheism, most of the time their motive is just because they want to live the way they want to live. And they, want to, they don't want to admit the idea they're going to answer to God. 
Okay, that, that's a totally invalid hypocritical uh, motive. Now, other people have gone through great difficulties in life, and they have cried out to God, and from their perspective, God was silent. He didn't answer. And so they will come to a temptation, there must not be a God. Okay, and that's the age-old argument. Okay, what about that? Okay, and so, in essence, the atheist in that world is judging God because God is not intervening when they think he should, the suffering of mankind. Now, in reality, if they would sit down and analyze their own personal lives, they're actually a reverse hypocrite. Okay, because they're judging God for not intervening in every case, or specifically their case. But if you look back in your life, all of us have seen suffering, and on occasion done nothing about it. So why would we expect God to do something about it in every single case? So we've done the same thing that they're judging God. That's why they're a reverse hypocrite, in a way. Okay, but I'm not judging them for their position, okay, of atheism, okay, because it's really not, there's really no true atheist, per se. Okay, you're just trying to get them to admit there's a God, but who cares? You know, that, that, like that's going to help them out? They can still believe in God and die and go to hell. Okay, it's, that's not really the issue on that is, uh, idea. Now, the temptation when we have unanswered prayer, maybe there's an issue, you've prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed, and, prayed and it's like it's not getting anywhere. Now, the temptation is to get mad at God. And now, people don't want to admit it that they get mad at God, but they do. You say, you ever got mad at God? All, all the time. And then when I do, I kind of sit myself down and say, hey, dangling, you're mad at a being who spoke this word into existence. I mean, you ought to have, think he's got more knowledge than you got. <laughs> I mean, Jonah got mad at God for his mercy. Ended up, he's so mad at God, and God was very patient with him because he was honest about it. It's no different than a child, children, teenager, where they get mad at their parents. Of course, we know no children do that. Okay, and so what is it? They don't understand why their parents do such and such, and so they get mad at them. And so the same is it translated to we get mad at God because he doesn't answer certain prayers or God doesn't intervene. So I want to kind of approach that subject on the silence of God to see if we could try to figure it out, try to get a little understanding of it. And the first thought is this, the temptation to doubt or question God, that is natural. That's a natural thing. If you would look in Ecclesiastes, still hold your finger in Psalms, I'm eventually going to get back to it. But Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Okay, I'm sure a few of you, I've heard this, where so -and -so, somebody said, I have prayed for so-and-so for 30 years, and then they got saved. Well, I guarantee in that 30-year time period, they had feelings of, what's the use? Okay, and quit praying, but then picked it back up. Okay, and so, if a person limits themselves to this life, that's depressing. Ecclesiastes 4 is Solomon. Solomon has raised a pretty cushy life. And this, this entire sermon, which Ecclesiastes is, is looking at life from under the sun. And man, does that get depressing. So when a person limits his viewpoint of this life on earth, chapter 4 will give the outcome. He says, so I returned and considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun. Now, he obviously hadn't seen them all, but he's considering them. And behold, the tears of such as were oppressed, and they had no comforter. And on the side of their oppressors, there was power, but they had no comforter. Wherefore, I praised the dead. Okay, you're going to look at life like that? I praise the dead, which are already dead, and more than the living which are alive. Yea, better is he, the one that's dead, 
then both they, the oppressed and the oppressor, which hath not yet been, who hath not seen the evil work that is done under the sun. So there's his limitation. So what, what is the outcome of that? Again, I considered all travail and every right work, and that for this a man is envied of his neighbor. In other words, you can't do right and get away with it. Somebody's going to gripe about it. And then he says, this is also vanity and vexation of spirit. Now that is the outcome when a person limits himself to this world. And so the temptation to doubt or question God is a natural thing. Okay, and so when a person has these thoughts, they might say to themselves, why am I thinking like this? That's normal. You're normal. That's a natural thing. Trust is supernatural. Okay, that's a whole different thing. Now, if a person questions or doubts God because he's prayed about something, that's something that's been a great burden, and so you question or doubt God, and if a person goes to the point where so they say, okay, I'm going to doubt God, I don't even think there's a God. Okay, so sit down and, and reason that out. Okay, so you're going to, you don't appreciate that God's silent about something, so you're going to draw the conclusion, okay, there's no God. Okay, then sit down and think about that. Okay, if there's no God, you are an accidental chance of a massive explosion that took 20, 20 billion years ago, and there's no scientific proof of that. You're going to claim science, and you've got no proof of it. I mean, what choice is that? And then if you look at nature, there's no justice in nature, and you're complaining? You know, dogs and cats and mice and all that stuff, there's no justice in nature, and you're complaining about that? Well, then don't complain about your injustices. So you got to change, you know, this viewpoint is a dead-end street, and it's not even a logical path. So then you got to come back, okay, so obviously that's wrong. I mean, I know what's right, but I know what's wrong. I know I didn't evolve from a monkey. Okay, and so then i got to go back to this. Okay, why is God silent? There's got to be a reason for that. Why is he silent about requests that I have? And so we go back to that and we look at it. Then we go to the Bible and find out, why does God not answer certain prayers? Well, he gives a reason. Why does God remain silent? Okay, if you would, James chapter 4. Okay, one reason God does not answer prayers is because we have the wrong motive. James 4 says because we want to consume it upon our lust. Okay, and so the Lord says, why should I give that to you? You're just going to run around and play with that and not even talk to me. So if I get rid of that, maybe you'll talk to me. So in James 4 it says we ask and receive not because, why? Because... We're going to consume it. We ask amiss, we're going to consume it on our lust. In Job 35, verse 13, the Lord says, I will not regard vanity. Put that on Americans. I will not regard vanity. In New York now, when a child is born, you can, you can X, check, male, female, other. What's other? Idiot. Vanity. That's nothing but vanity. Okay? There's no logic to it. There's no science to it. There's no biological science to it. There's no... I mean, it, it's so illogical. And then these people pray and ask God to answer their quest based upon their vanity. And God in heaven is saying, Gag! Take a leap. I ain't wasting time. Okay? So one reason on it, prayers goes unanswered is because we have an improper motive. Another reason unanswered prayer or God doesn't intervene is because of sin. Okay, so obviously, uh, Psalm 66 verse 18 is that if I regard sin, okay, in Psalm 66, I want to get the exact wording on that one. So he says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Now, we know God hears you, but the idea of that is he's not going to answer it. He's going to remain silent. 
You ever talk to somebody that just don't talk? This is on, on the streets all the time. You offer somebody a gospel track. Hi. So when they do that, I go like this. Maybe you're deaf. You know, something like that. But uh, God won't hear. Now, God told Israel, okay, because in the Old Testament, God had a, a deal with Israel, the Mosaic Covenant. It was like a marriage proposal and a covenant of that. And now he told them in Deuteronomy 31, 17, that if you do such and such, I'm going to put a blessing and cursing in front of you. If you obey my words, I'm going to give you blessing. If you don't obey my words, here's all the curses. And the curses outweigh the blessings like 10 to 1. And then he said, I'm going to hide my face from you. Deuteronomy 31, 17. That idea is repeated all through that Bible to Israel. All through there. So he told them beforehand. Now you get to 1 Samuel chapter 8, and they're tired of the theocratic republic that they had. So they, they uh, wanted to get a king. And in 1 Samuel 8, verse 18... Because now they're putting their trust in a monarch, they're putting their trust in the government, and that where Americans are at, instead of God. God says to Samuel, he's, he told Samuel, he told them, you tell this before they make this decision. Because this is what I'm going to do if you do this. 1 Samuel 8.18 and ye shall cry in the day because of your king, which ye shall have chosen you, ye shall have chosen you, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. He told them beforehand, so they got no gripes. Okay, now that idea is, is brought through all by the prophets. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea. Isaiah told them that, okay, you people are still doing your religious things. You're going down to the temple, but you're doing them for the wrong motive. And guess what? God's not listening. You can do all your thing. When I was in Israel, uh, I was uh, right next to the the, um, the Wailing Wall. And you go, you go back, and there's like underground rooms in there. And they've got copies of the Talmud and all these scriptures back in there. And when I went in there, there's this big guy. He was probably 6'4", probably 300 pounds, just huge guy, big beard. And he is putting on a religious show. I mean, it was entertaining. I tried to video record it, but one of the Jews said, tss, 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 tss. he told me not to do that. I mean, he was standing there going, I mean, he was going at it. And I can imagine God in heaven say, Wow, oh, he's got a good voice. But I ain't paying attention to him. Why is all vain show? Okay, and that's what goes on. He told them in Isaiah 1 verse 15. He told them in Hosea, he said, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Now, that, most people only read that part of the verse. The verse continues. They have rejected knowledge. I will reject thee. He told them that beforehand. Now, Jeremiah... God straight up told Jeremiah, and it's the end of Judah, the reign of Judah, Babylon's getting ready to conquer him, and Jeremiah was the main prophet in Jerusalem. And he told Jeremiah three times, he said, don't you pray for them. He says, if you do, I won't listen. Now that's pretty bad when God gives up. Jeremiah 7, 11, and 14, three times he told him, Jeremiah, don't you pray for these people because I will not listen. Now, not only did God say that, but he steps it up. Okay, if you would, look in Proverbs chapter 1. This is a side of God that is rarely discussed. Okay, Proverbs 1 verse 24. Now, in, in your own nature, that if you have done your best to instruct somebody, gone out of your way to instruct them, sacrificed amazingly to instruct them, and they just shun your instruction, shun you. I mean, you may come back and try again because you got charity, you got some patience, you love this person. Eventually, you're going to say, what's the use? God's no different. 
in Jeremiah and Proverbs 1 verse 24, he said this, because I have called and ye refused. Now this is technically Israel. I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. So they're not listening. But ye have said it not all my counsel would none of my reproof. Okay, so now God has reached his limit. What's he going to do? He's going to break his silence. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. Oh, isn't that a sight of God that's different? Verse 28, he said, Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. Now, doctrine, that's a Jew in the tribulation. Okay, but the Lord actually gets mocking them. If you would, Isaiah 65. Now, this Isaiah 65, if you see what's going on in our culture as far as the green movement, climate change, worship of the creation rather than a creator, boy, you can really see how this is going on. History repeats itself. Isaiah 65, verse 1, he says this. God is speaking through Isaiah. He says, I have thought, I am sought of them that ask not for me. I am found of them that sought me not. I said, behold me, behold me, unto a nation that was not called by my name. So that's not Israel, that's a Gentile nation. He says, I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people. Now that's Israel. I spread out my hands. He said, which walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. Same thing what we're seeing that the media and culture is pushing. A people that provoked me to anger continually in my face and that sacrificed in gardens. Oh, they're there hugging their trees. Animal rights activists. And burning incense upon altars of brick. Yeah, smoking their weed and stuff. Which remain among the graves and lodge in the monuments. Which eat swine's flesh. Of course, that's forbidden for the Jews. And broth of abominable things is in their vessels. Which say, stand by thyself. These people are talking to God. Stand by thyself. Come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. That's what people are thinking. God's a racist. Jesus said, only go to the Jews in his ministry. That's racist. Okay, they think they're holier than God. That's where that phrase comes from. Okay, and then the Lord says, These are smoke in my nose, a fire that burneth all the day. Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silence. Okay, now he's going to break his silence. What's he going to do? But will recompense, even recompense into their bosom. Your iniquities and the iniquities of your father together, saith the Lord, which have burned incense upon the mountains and blasphemed me upon the hills. What are they doing up there? Child sacrifices. That's what they're doing. He said, therefore will I measure their former work into their bosom. So another reason why God doesn't answer to prayer, doesn't intervene, why God remains silent, is because of multiple sin. Okay, and so uh, the next thought is this, is trust is the ultimate goal that God wants us to have about his silence. He wants us to trust him. Okay, uh, now if you went back to that Psalms 28, if you did keep that. Now, I said before that trust is supernatural. It steps out outside of under the sun. you got to live above the sun in your mind. Trust is what God ultimately desires for us, to trust Him. You ever hear, have anybody say to you, you need to trust me? Okay, if you're going to say that, you better have something to back it up. Okay, in Psalm 28, there he is crying at the beginning. God, he's asking God, please don't be silent, don't be silent. And then in verse 7, he says, The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him. And I am helped. He didn't say his prayer was answered. I'm helped. Trust is God's goal. 
A lot of times when people go through um, difficulties of life, tragedies, a lot of times Christians will cite this verse to encourage them. And I'm not saying they shouldn't. They should cite this verse. It's a very well-known verse, but it's a toughie. He says this, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Now, man, that's clear. Okay, and that's often used. But the problem with that is people will take that verse within a temporal setting under the sun. And then they'll read novels and see Christian movies, and these Christian movies and novels will always have the solution under the sun and live happily ever after. I mean, TV, sitcom, family sitcoms like the old Leave it to Beaver, you know, there'll be a problem at the beginning of the, the, the 30 minute program. And, Ward Cleaver has it fixed by the 30 minutes it's over. Man, wouldn't life be wonderful as like that? That's not life. For every time where you have a happy ending on this earth, you got a thousand times where there is tragic. And in Romans 8, that is true. But what is it within its context? You've got to look at the context. You just can't rip that verse outside of the context. God wants the best for every one of his children. But that best may not seem to be here on earth. Because we're stuck in this time capsule, God is not. He's looking at eternity. God wants the best for every one of his children where? At the judgment seat of Christ. That's where he wants his best. Things on this earth may not appear good and you not, may not get the solution and God may not answer your prayer, but the judgment seat of Christ, he's going to give you that understanding why. Romans chapter 8 is dealing with the glorified body. You'll see that in verse 23, the redemption of your body. That's where God wants the best for the person. You see, it's like a coach of a team. A coach of a team will put his players through rigorous practice and exercise and put all these tests on them and they will moan and groan and gripe and complain in the practice. Come on, coach, let up. But the coach, a good coach in his mind, he's not looking at practice. He's looking at the game, the match. He wants them to be prepared, be prepared for that day. And the kid's looking at just practice, he's going to say, I'm out of here. An officer in the military, he will put a soldier through rigorous training. He will harass him, yell at him, scream at him, make him suffer, put him through all sorts of stuff. Why? Because he wants that soldier to be ready on the battlefield. That's his goal. Jesus Christ's goal for each of his children is to put us through tough things in this life. Why? Because on the judgment seat of Christ, that's the big deal. That's where, at the judgment seat of Christ, all things work together for good to them and love God. When a person understands that idea, then we can, eh, the word cope, we can get some understanding or trust God's plan. Trust is supernatural. Isaiah 26, it says <clears throat> that we are, <clears throat> that will keep them in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, who trusteth in thee. See, trust is, is a supernatural thing. A fellow told me years ago, he said, every tear that's shed on earth is an investment in joy in heaven. I guarantee at the judgment seat of Christ, when we hit that judgment seat of Christ and we see life backwards with hindsight, we're going to think at that time, I wish I would have suffered more for Jesus. Now, we're not thinking that now. I am certainly not thinking that now. <laughs> but at the judgment seat of Christ, we are going to think that. Because the ones who really suffer for Christ, they're going to really get the awards at the judgment seat. They're, they're the, uh, the prisoner of war. They're the MIA. They're the one that got shot in the battle. Okay, that's the one that gets the awards at the judgment seat of Christ. And that's where all things work together for good. What does God do with our tears here because of unanswered prayer? Well, according to Psalm 56, he places them in a bottle. He collects those tears and puts them in a bottle. And it's like an alabaster box. And he's going to take those tears and he's going to show, 
I've kept track of those. I've kept track of all those tears, and you're going to get all these blessings because you shed those tears there on earth. Now you're going to be happier in heaven as a result of that. Trust is the goal for the silence of God. Now, the Lord is not going to, the Lord is going to break his silence pretty quick. The amazing thing about God to me is God remains silent about all the false doctrines. All these people teaching stuff around the world. Now, if somebody lies about you or says something about your character, is it not in human nature to defend yourself? God don't feel that way. He doesn't come down and correct his fault. You're wrong here. He doesn't do that. He does that on purpose. He allows it. Why does he allow that? To prove our sincerity. That's the purpose of false doctrine, heresies. To prove our sincerity. Are we going to weed through everything and come up with the truth? And God watches us weed through this and weed through that and come through here. And the Lord says, boy, I like that. That guy is sincere. That guy is adamant. That guy, that... I, I'm going to take this one out of the way, give them a little understanding here. And man, the truth is going to part right in front of them. It's going to be so clear to them. But yet, they're not going to, they're not going to understand why people don't see what they see. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to break his silence with a shout. Pretty quick. Psalm 50. <clears throat> For the believer, <clears throat> this would be... The shout, the voice of the archangel. For the Jew going into the tribulation, this will be the shout of the second coming of Christ. Both of them got a shout. Psalm 50, the mighty God. I think we sang about I think they sang about him. <clears throat> Even the Lord has spoken. Oh, he broke a silence. And called the earth from the rising of the sun unto the going down thereof. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty hath shined. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. He waited 6,000 years for that. He has listened to every mockery of his Bible. Every professor in the college class that mocked the Lord's listening. He's keeping account, remaining silent. He's watched every murder. He's watched every suffering. And the Lord is keeping account. And he's going to get make everything right, either at the judgment seat for the believer and at the white throne judgment. It's going to be where things are made manifest. In this process, God is seeking for friendship. As we get to closer to the Christ coming, the Lord is even skeptical about who listens. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, if any man hear my voice. He didn't say when, he says if. He's knocking on the church door. He's going to these churches knocking on the door and he's out there and said, If any man will hear my voice, I will come into him and will sup with him. It's all on an individual basis. But he doesn't know in this Laodicean age things are such a mess. In the churches, the Lord Jesus Christ is looking for a friend. He's going to pick one off here, one here, one there, one there. And see, that's what he's looking for. And that's through this time of God's silence. We can admire our God. In our situation, in your situation, whatever you're praying about, just keep praying. Keep praying and asking God. Ask God to give you grace about it. I mean, if it's a tough thing, just don't stop praying. Trust the Lord. Trust His plan. I know that's easy to say. And in my gut, it's just ripping me up because there are things I've prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed about. And it's like, it's like a Super Bowl in the gym with a nice ceiling. You take a Super Bowl, whoo, and that thing just goes all over the place. You see, you just get to feel like that. That's a normal thing. But there's going to be a day that Lord Jesus Christ is going to break his silence. And he's on the winning side. And I'm glad I'm on that winning side. So the Lord wants us to trust him. And when he breaks his silence, man, we can yell and scream with him. Okay, we'll stop. Lord, I do pray and ask you to help us to see that you want us to keep praying, you want us to keep trusting.
And trust is a supernatural thing. It's beyond my capacity. Spirit of God, you're going to have to give me that grace. And Lord, I do pray and ask that there are many, many burdens. A lot of times people hide their burdens. And they pray and pray and cry and, and, and uh, beg you. And it's just like nothing seems to be happening. And like Paul said, on a shipwreck, a ship's going down, as you told him. He said, I believe God even as it was told me. What was told me? That all things work together for good to them that love God. Okay, it's my part to love you. And recognize that that scripture will be fulfilled at the judgment seat. Help us to trust you in that matter. Well, heads bowed and eyes are closed. If you'd like to use the altar, it's open for you. We're stuck in this time capsule and we see a lot of heartache and have a lot of requests and God just seems quiet about it. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. Understanding is knowing the answer to the question why. It is helpful when you understand the question why, but thine own understanding, sometimes the Lord will not answer that question why. And so that's where we, he wants us to trust. He does want the best for every one of his children, but the best will be at the judgment seat of Christ. Lord, thank you for your words, and I do pray you'd help us to recognize your silence is for a reason, it's for a purpose. Uh, it's sometimes for your mercy, it's sometimes for your grace. It's sometimes it's because of <clears throat> vain thoughts, a vain heart. Sometimes it's because uh, our sin. We look inwardly at ourselves, but sometimes it's because... You're looking at the judgment seat of Christ for every one of your children, and you want the best for us there. And I pray you'd help us to trust that thought, that idea, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.